Hey, welcome back to season three of Make More Music, the podcast that connects you to music and one another. My name's Chris. I'm a board certified music therapist, and I am happy to be back. I hope y'all are doing good. Uh, it's been a crazy season. We're now at over a year of, of this COVID craziness, and here we are. Uh, maybe worse for the wear. I don't know. Uh, a lot of good things, a lot of crazy things, but I'm happy to be back. I'm happy to be getting out new episodes. I have three great sponsors for this season I can't wait to tell you about, including a great episode today with the first person I connected with through this whole project, and that is Gary Cooper from Partscaster Concierge. You might have heard him on some of the other gear-related podcasts, but I'm here to tell you about my journey of building a parts caster the first time I've ever done any of these hands-on DIY type things. So I'm excited to tell you about it. I'm excited to tell you about the other people that we partnered with, Porter Pickups and Gun Street Wiring. You heard Sean on a previous episode for Gun Street Wiring, and you'll hear Brian next episode, as well as a couple of other episodes sprinkled in with our boy M.W. Hale, who also released his album. We finally got it out, not on Halloween. So we got the EP out in November, and we got the album out in January. So go check those out. M.W. Hale, album is Sorrowed Son. I played a ton of instruments. Matt wrote all the songs. I engineered it, mixed it, air quotes, mastered it. And it's out there. It's alive. It's not perfect, but go check it out. And... Other than that, let's let's hop right into it. Let's uh, hear about these sponsorships and let's listen to the episode. Season three of Make More Music is brought to you by three great sponsors, and I wanted to tell you about them real quick. So I built a guitar, and it is awesome. I have a companion blog post in the show notes that tells you about building a parts caster from concept to creation, and it tells you about the three great sponsors I got to work with. First is Parts Caster Concierge. Gary offers a truly concierge experience from build constructions and consultations to unfinished bodies and wooden pedal enclosures, all the way to custom requests and fully custom builds. He offers traditional styles as well as unique one-of-a-kind DIY experiences with guitars that wouldn't traditionally have a bolt-on neck with a parts caster style build. Second is Porter Pickups. Brian and his team have been winding pickups focused on finding you the right sound and winding with a purpose. Their five-person shop offers consultation through their online pickup chooser form to help you get closer to the sounds you're looking for. They sound killer. They just launched an entry-level affordable line called the Gatekeeper, so if you're looking for something to try for the first time, look them up. Our last sponsor is Gun Street Wiring Shop, where they create wiring harnesses for your guitar needs with simple, elegant instructions to help even the first-time solderer, like myself, get the sound they're looking for. He's not into promoting parts, myths, mojo, and magic. He sells circuits, and their customer service is top-notch. From basic upgrades to wild enhancements, Gun Street has got what you need. As I said, all the links are in the show notes, and you'll hear me blab about it more. But if you want more, look there. All right, back to the show. Welcome, Gary, from the Parts Caster concierge i'm happy to have you on today we've been obviously chatting back and forth since like i don't know october or november whenever we started chatting and i feel like yeah you've been like my my obi-wan for the past few months so (laughs) i was thinking about it this morning i was like oh it's probably really good to like actually get to know more about you personally since i just keep asking you questions (laughs) like multiple days a week so uh, that's what it takes so Gotta have some open communication for this stuff, you know, it's been the best part. I'm, I'm excited to tell everybody about everything you do, but especially just the fact that like every time I was like, uh, I was like freaking out. I was like, if I just ask him, he'll get back to me when he's got some time, we'll get this ball rolling, especially in the middle of the finish. But, um, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. You ready for some rapid fire? Fire away. All right, cool. I want you to open up, whether it's Spotify or Apple Music or whatever you listen to, what is the last track you played? Oh, goodness. Uh, This is uh, Crumb, a song called Plants. Tell Um, me a little bit more about that. I don't know anything about any of that. So uh, I just recently found out, they've popped up on my Spotify when I was listening to uh, some other stuff. They're just like one of the side bands. Um, 
And I guess it's one of the guitar players from a group called Wand, kind of psychedelic, garagey type music. Um, but Crumb is a little bit different. They almost have some borderline like trip hop kind of hip hop drum beats going on behind this poppy stuff. They've got a female singer that's got a really pretty voice. Super chill stuff. I really dig it. Uh, what's the name of that track again? Uh, the song is called Plants, and the uh, band is Crumb. They've got a few albums, and honestly, all of them are are fantastic. So I just kind of put them all on shuffle and let them rip. Nice. I'm definitely hitting that up next time I'm in the car. So cool. next, I want you to tell me, you can be as specific or as philosophical or as vague as you want to be, but if you were an instrument, what would you be and why? Oh, man. That's a weird one. Um <laughs> I mean, so I spent a lot of time. to get metaphysical here for a minute. I know. Yeah, I spent you a lot of time You brought up psychedelic guitar. garage rock, so <laughs> you know, we have to go there. I uh, I spend a lot of time around guitars, so that's probably, you know, the quick and easy answer. It's, it's what I'm really in tune with lately. Not so much, I, I, I play moderately, but it's you know, really been getting into the nooks and crannies of of how they work. But uh, I, I just, I really kind of identify with percussion primarily i guess nice. um, that was my my first real instrument when i was getting started with music as a kid so i just like beating on things i like being loud and noisy when i have the opportunity so it's it's probably more a percussion instrument than anything Ooh, or maybe like andy mckee or something like <laughs> <laughs> sure i like it cool so um you know i first started asking this people this question back in like you know, March when I felt like we need inspiration, but here we are almost a year later. And I still am asking what's been inspiring you because it's not the news right now. So what's something that's been inspiring you recently? Um, it, here lately, it's starting to see some of the builds that I've been working on six months ago are starting to get finished up and they're looking amazing. Um, I've been really fortunate with having some pretty talented clientele actually that that's got a hold of my work and, uh, seeing everything finished up. I've been doing my own builds and my own projects and I'm pretty happy with those too, but uh, seeing what, what other people are kind of getting their hands on it and they take the, take the project and hit the ground running. And uh, it, it, there's some RDs that have come back. A dude just put a Bigsby um, and a robot graves neck on it. And it's just, it's killer looking. Sounds awesome. I've had quite a few inquiries off that. Like, Hey, how can I build one of these sort of things? Nice. Uh, there's another, Another guy who just finished another RD that's got like a berry finish, a berry burst finish rather, and it's it's super clean looking, really really pretty. I, I wish I could get a hold of it to get some some of my professional photographers, you know, to to shoot it too. So, um, but yeah, seeing all this stuff come back is is probably what's been the most rewarding thing lately. It makes me want to keep on going and see where it takes off. What are a couple of accounts we should check out? Uh, showing off a few of these. Uh, Geo Visualize, um, Anthony is the one with the Berry Burst RD, and he actually does quite a few builds. I'm, I'm really honored he started working with me. Um, he's done quite a few parts casters. He's got a Jazz Master he did with like a teal metal flake uh, kind of deal. That's really, or, or sorry, the Strat was like a teal metal flake, and then he's got another one that's like a dark emerald teal color. That's the Jazz Master that's also nice. really pretty. Um, but he's pretty traveled as well. And so he has this thing where he kind of bases all of his builds. He kind of names them based off uh, geographical coordinates for wherever he's been. So each project is kind of based off of a different trip sort mm. of. So larger concept going on. I like there. that. I like um, that. All right. So the other build came from a gentleman named Chase McCree. Uh, it's his, his account's pretty personal. He's got a lot of family and stuff on there, but um, his, his guitar is featured uh, on my page as well. If you want to get a good look at it. Great. Well, we'll definitely show some pictures of that. And anybody that listens over the span of any amount of time will be sick of hearing about my guitar soon. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't quit raving about that. So this is probably, you've, you've already given me a ton of good pro tips. So what, whether it's for parts casters or whether it's, you know, uh, you know, Blake Weiland told me how to keep your take warm in the car. So what's a pro tip or a hack that you like to use that you feel like everyone should know about? Uh, dude, the, the biggest thing with just globally, the whole process is patience. That's the hardest thing is just taking a deep breath, taking a step back when you need to, trying to check things out and just not rushing. Whether you're even just conceptually figuring out what you want, it's really easy to dedicate. Like I want bam, bam, bam. I want these parts. And then you get halfway through your build and you're like, oh, maybe I wanted a five-way switch or maybe I wanted this or that. So 
take time in every step. The planning it out is important. Make sure you're getting what you want. Um, you know, if you really want all this crazy stuff in your guitar and it's outside of your budget, you got to be patient, save some more money. Um, and then once mm -hmm. you get into it, the assembly uh, is, is kind of the same thing. Finish, obviously, very patient process, lots of curing. It, it gets close to a week or two in and you start to touch it and it's not tacky <laughs> anymore. It looks awesome. You're like, all right, let's put some parts on this thing. But it's honestly the, the more patience you have with the whole process. Uh, the guitar is not really meant to be something that you're going to have it for a long time. You know, it's not supposed to be like a quick, quick reward type of project that you put a lot mm -hmm. of time, a lot of effort into it. And then it's something, you know, you're going to have it for decades. It might be something you pass on to somebody else, you know, who plays an instrument down the road and it's, it's going to have a long life. So it's getting it done in six weeks or sometimes six months, put that extra time into it and you have a better instrument in the long run. Mm. Yeah. Six months when you look at a lifetime is nothing. So just trying exactly. to chill and blend and just blink and let it go. <laughs> Keep going. That's exactly. good. Yeah. That's, that's uh hitting hard when I was thinking about the finish and uh, I'll go through that debacle later, but yeah, patience. <laughs> that's, patience. Yeah. That's patience. It, especially when you, you've done all the planning, you've done dry fits and then you get to the finish. Like that's, that's where you're really testing yourself. It's like, man, it's so close, but you just, you don't want to squeeze anything too hard yet. You don't want to risk wiping something on the finish that might, you know, cause some blemishes or problems. You just have to sit there and, let it cure on the wall till it's ready. Yeah. Some really, really nice wall art for a little bit. So exactly. Good. All right. Total swerve when you're, you know, working in the shop or you're chilling around the house, what's your go-to junk food? Ooh, uh, man, my wife's been getting these little, uh, golden grams and in individual packets lately. And honestly, I don't do too many snacks. Um, but they've just been sitting around and I notice that they're missing quite frequently. So been uh, golden grams here lately. Those are good. I love any, I'm a, I'm a snack person. I try to chill out on it. I've been doing um, intermittent fasting for the past little while. Sure. So, you know, 10 AM rolls around and I'm real hungry. <laughs> so gotcha. I have to watch myself uh, around that like eight to 10 AM or eight to t eight to noon time. But I'll tell you, every now and then we score some Albanese gummy bears and they don't oh. last very long. They, they go pretty quick. They're actually, they're based from around here in Indiana, a couple hours away, but they're, nice. if you like gummy bears, they're probably about the best thing in the world. Okay. Well, point taken. That's not very far from me. So Think, think I need to make that happen. <laughs> think I need to make that happen. Um, lastly, somebody that's doing something cool. So anybody, a person, a project, or an organization that you want to give a shout out to? Who? Um, probably I'm going to have to go with uh, kind of my build sensei on this one. His name is Jay, uh, Jay Lewis. He runs JML Instruments, JML Guitars. Um, he does all custom builds. He's a... Uh, more or less like a master woodworker luthier he's been super friendly and supportive kind of uh got hooked up with him through friends of friends we're all within the same circle of of people and as i start building everybody's like hey do you know jay and i'm like i know of him i've seen his bands play you know he's friends with thomas or whatever um, but as i got to know him dude just is super warm took me right in answers all my questions uh, anything that i get that's kind of over my head he's he's right there to you know step me off the ledge and be like, this is what you need to do. It's not that hard, that sort of thing. Um, outside of what he's done for me personally, his own work is, is it just speaks for himself. If you could uh, check out his page, he does a lot of really, really cool builds. Um, he really does focuses on like neck through type builds, string through type stuff. Um, he's definitely got like a heavier crowd. He's doing some, some pretty extreme shapes, but he also does a lot of less Pauls, SG type. Um, my build that he did is actually based off of a Maserite, which is the first time he'd really done that shape. And, uh, he liked it so much. He ended up building one for himself kind of alongside. So kind of flattered that, uh, he dug it enough to make one for himself. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. I just pulled up his site and these SGs look amazing. I like <laughs> his, uh, the like look of the stripe with following down the neck. He's got that on several of these guitars and they look great yeah so his that's that's the neck through design where he makes a neck blank and then he attaches the body wings through it and it's uh, it's all one it. piece as where my parts caster designs are based off the fender style kind of like bolt-on neck um 
in the mid range of that is like a set neck where the neck is glued onto the body, but his neck through designs are, it's, it's basically all one piece from the headstock to where you're, you're putting your strap on at the base of the guitar. So awesome sustain, great tone. They're killer. Looks great. Yeah. He's nearby and pretty nearby to you. It looks like. Yeah. He's based out of Indianapolis about an hour away. Very cool. Very cool. Well, let's get back into um, what, you mentioned percussion and you mentioned uh, being a kid and getting into that. So I want to know maybe even before that, what were some of your first musical memories? Uh, uh, well, actually I got my very first black eye, uh, listening while singing Bon Jovi, um, when I was about four years old, kind of funny. That's a, that's a great memory. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. All right. See, so you're rocking out to some Bon Jovi. How'd yeah. that happen? Uh, basically my mom was paying more attention to me while I was being super cute and singing how I'm a, a cowboy and riding on a steel horse and dead or alive and whatnot and kind of rear-ended another car from what I recollect but there's some, oh, snap. some pictures of me with you know a big big black eye kind of bruised up but it was just for me being cute I can't help it oh wow that that's pretty funny so you were listening to to some real deal hair stuff <laughs> back in the day so um as you're growing up you said you got into percussion what are uh, what was influencing you and what made you want to do band or whatever, whatever you were a part of? And, and what were you doing when you first started picking up instruments? Um, percussion was kind of just what I was first drawn to. Um, making music in general, uh, just being creative. I like to draw stuff. I like to write stuff. I'm pounding on things, making rhythms. It's just if I'm not making something, I, I don't know, it just doesn't feel as fulfilling. So I've just always kind of been that way. Um, drums in particular, just kind of what I was drawn to primarily because it was easiest. It's what came the most natural. I didn't really have mm -hmm. to read music. I didn't have to learn theory until they put a xylophone in front of me. Um, <laughs> it was, you know, you get a practice pad and some sticks and you just bang on stuff. And it was, they would show me a quarter note and a half note and how to read time signatures and stuff like that. And it was more or less somebody would do it in front of me and then I could repeat it back to them. And with an instrument like fingerings and whatnot, it just, it was not as quick for me to, to learn that type of stuff. So drums were just almost preternatural. And then as I got a drum kit and stepped up from a drum pad, learning how to use your hand and your feet, you know, together or separately or however it takes to make the beat, it just more coordination kind of built on top of that. And it just something that never really left. I'm, I'm not going to sit behind a drum kit and start wailing, but I could always just sit behind a kit and at least keep a beat with somebody and have some fun, you know? Great. So did you do band throughout middle and high school or what was your kind of history with that? Well, I did percussion with like the formal stuff in school up through like in middle school, we started doing marching. Um, I was pretty good. I don't know if I you know, don't want to brag on myself like top chair or anything, but I was the one that they picked to do the Quinns probably because I was a little bit, you know, bigger than everybody else. So I could just kind of handle the weight, but I also handled, you know, multiple drums and the rhythms and everything else they kind of took to play. So mm. um, I ended up marching for a couple of years through middle school with big drums. And then as I got into high school, found out it wasn't so much just for fun. They were being very competitive and uh, I just, I don't have much of a competitive nature. It lost its, its luster to me. So I ended up going more into the jazz band and nice. uh, that's when I started playing the stringed instruments and stuff more guitar and bass and stuff like that more formally through school. Um, I got my first drum kit when I was, I think 11, my grandpa bought it for me. Uh, it just kind of stayed up in his attic. Cause that's about the only space. Always the grandparents. Really play. Yeah, oh, yeah. He was the it's best. never your parents. They get drums. <laughs> always somebody else. That's uh, that's the kind of grandpa he was, you know, if I wanted a moped or a motorcycle or something that, you know, mom would say no to, it's just like, let me, let me call grandpa, you know, I'm just going to yeah. try this and go here first. <laughs> exactly. But uh, no, he definitely, he, he bought me my first electric guitar too. I'm um, not shortly thereafter. I, he took me to uh music go round, kind of this used music place. Mm -hmm. And there was a black Mexican Stratocaster that I thought was just the coolest thing in the world. And he took me to look at it. And next thing I know, he's, you know, over there paying for it. So I'm just very fortunate, a borderline spoiled kid, I'm sure. But uh, that's just, he's a very generous dude. And I'm very fortunate for that. So I kept that guitar for a long time. I kept the drum kit for a long time. And I've always just, as I've outgrown the instruments, I've made sure to at least pay homage to the fact that he, he got me that Stratocaster and it might only be worth a couple hundred bucks. I had a hard time keeping it in tune. 
Um, I did mm-hmm. sell it and I got rid of it, but I kept the interest alive. I've upgraded my instruments. I've upgraded my abilities. The, the, the sentiment behind everything has never really left. So that's really good. So aside from jazz band, were you playing in any like rock bands, garage bands? What were you doing kind of growing up? Yeah. High school is kind of where I started just getting more outside of the drums, playing outside of the band and stuff. And uh, friends are getting into guitars and bass. And that's where I started gravitating more towards guitar. It was mainly power chords and my love for Nirvana primarily, uh, just being noisy and figuring out how to make all the squeals and endless nameless and not Mm. so much song structure or anything cool, but just loud amplifiers and distortion and fuzz and feedback was, was really the most drawing thing to me. Um, and then I started, uh, I've been in a couple garage bands in and out with just different friends. Um, got into some electronic stuff more so after high school, uh, synthesizers and Ableton and, and all kinds of stuff. So I, I really just like making noise from, from all aspects, really. I love that. So um, what are the steps between now? I don't even know how you would classify yourself now as far as like, uh, would you still say like side hustle or second business or uh, how do you get from, you know, this person that's interested in music to this person that decides uh, I'm going to start trying to make these things. And because you do, (laughs) you do a lot more than just bodies and things like that too. You do a lot and I'm sure you've done a lot of other things as well. So how did you get into all this stuff? Well, um, I, so I've I've been in a band more or less with my friend Nate on and off for 10, 15 years or more, uh, different bands, different groups or whatever. He's more or less like my musical soulmate. And uh, he, he he's always wanted a jazz master. And if I, I told him if I had a dollar for every time I heard him say, man, I wish I had a jazz master, like I could have bought him some really nice jazz masters by now. <laughs> and uh, a, a, about three or four years ago, I just kind of got the itch. Um to put together a parts caster. It just seemed really interesting to me, figuring out how things are kind of modular. There's, there's a body shape, uh, the neck design. There's only a couple different neck shapes, more or less the heel from a telly to a strat that kind of, you know, one will fit in the other, but they're not necessarily backwards compatible, learning kind of ins and outs of how things work. And uh, I bought a body off of Reverb for like a Basswood Jazzmaster that was spray painted this sort of honestly hideously orange like metal color. It didn't really turn out that well. Um, But I knew that I bought it for like 50 bucks and free shipping and I had to strip it and paint it purple. That didn't go well. So I stripped it and painted a different shade of purple, got all my parts, started piecing things together. Um, There are some kind of finer aspects of building that, that that honestly, I'm still learning how to do some, some real setups and really fine tune the truss rod and a neck and stuff like that. Uh, but I've got a, a local tech guru that goes by the name of Guitar Bob around here. And he's just really well known for primarily his amplifiers. Like anything that's wrong with an amplifier, you can go to this guy and he will weed it out of there. But uh, guitar wise, he can pretty much do anything you ever need. So he kind of picks up wherever I leave off. And uh, this first project, I got got the paint put together. I got most of the hardware put on. I got it strung up, but I'm just having some some dead frets here or there, not quite knowing where to go. I've watched some YouTube videos, and sometimes it just helps to have a person in front of you or at least a voice you can talk to back and forth. So Bob was kind of the, the, the end of the line for that first build. And as I got this jazz master together um, throughout the process, Nate had also went through some some personal stuff. I don't want to give too much away, but some health issues and he had a kid and also got married and all this, you know, really exciting stuff and still glad to have my best friend around. So I ended up kind of gifting this guitar to him uh, right before he got married and uh, it took off from there. He's, he's played it and loves it and tells me all the time it's his favorite guitar. And that kind of sparked the interest to build more. So that's, that's kind of the, the origin story. And then from there, I started my second build And no intentions of turning it into a business at all, but just keeping it going, making the next one. I got one done. Now let me try to do one for myself. And uh, this was a Meteora style body that I got. Mm. And I wanted to put a different type of bridge on it than what the builder was really willing to do. And we had some emails back and forth about, you know, spacing and placement. This guy kind of works with preset templates and a CNC machine. So he has some flexibility, but ended up just doing kind of part of the work. And then he said, Hey, you know, I'll let you figure out what you need to do for the rest of this. And so once I got the body, um, I went to another friend who had a drill press at the time 
and had him do the drilling for the string through on this bridge. And it just came out kind of crooked and wonky. And I thought, man, I could do a better job myself. So I saved up a couple hundred bucks and bought a drill press, um, filled all the holes, did it again myself. It came out straight. It was just a matter of using a template and being a little more patient with it, I think. Um, but it kind of took off from there. It was a drill press and then a bandsaw. And then I needed a planer to try and make my own body. And before I knew it, I had a whole garage full of stuff. <laughs> it just accumulates quickly, just, huh? just kind of snuck up on me. Um, and then I do work for Best Buy. I've got Geek Squad basically hanging TVs, doing home theater. And when COVID happened, uh, we got furloughed. And I had a few months basically to, to figure out what I was going to do next. And I already had all these tools and was kind of had a few builds under my belt as just kind of a hobby weekend type thing. And I thought I will uh, take some of my 401k that I've got, invest it in turning it into a business and hmm. filed an LLC and hit the ground running. Wow. So that's pretty funny because around the time that I became aware of you, I think was that first raffle you did. Um which was significant to me around the time of, I don't know. I mean, so much was going on uh, a year ago. We had the, the Australia fires, yeah, had the bush fires. And then there were the fires out West and then uh, COVID starts happening. And then as you're aware of, like I'm in Louisville. So uh, the Brianna Taylor news starts coming out or at the right. same time, the, um, uh, the news of the, all the other things that are going on, George Floyd and all the other uh, killings that were happening. It was like really intense, like hard to even cope with like walking through the day. And I, then I, really I, I saw your raffle come along and I was like, man, this is sweet. Like, A, it looks amazing. B, like what a great idea. So you, you launched that raffle. Tell us a little bit more about that. Cause I think that like took you a little su by surprise too, right? Uh, yeah, man, that, that first one was definitely the most successful of the three, and it, it, there's a lot of circumstances, I'm sure, that all kind of swirled together with its success, but it, it, it kind of started again with, with Nate, my, my buddy. Um, he got furloughed from his job. He was a manager at a, a, a kind of a bar restaurant type deal down in Indianapolis, and uh, he's, it just amazed me when he starts making these posts about how he's making hot sauce and then he's going to donate all of these profits that he makes to his employees to kind of help keep them going and supplement their income. And I'm like, wow. Dude, yeah, exactly. So I love the creativity that came <laughs> kind of like during all of this. It's everything. It's not just that. It's like, wow, sure. so interesting. Yeah. It's a, that's, there's been a lot of bad stuff that's happened in the last year, but at the same time, if you look at all of the, the creativity that's come out of it and just people fight through they're, they're, pretty durable they're pretty strong they're, they're gonna make it through a lot so it's just seeing all the all the ways that get squeezed out of us is, is pretty wild but yeah nate starts making this hot sauce and he did a couple batches of it and it's pretty successful and he's able to pass out a couple hundred bucks here there to people that otherwise are getting like little to no unemployment while everybody's in limbo not knowing what's going on mm -hmm. so you know seeing that coupled with george floyd brianna taylor everything else and I don't know what to do about it, honestly. I mean, I, I'm upset by it. it. It bothers me, but I don't know what, as one person, I, I don't, don't know what influence I can really hold. So what I can do is build guitars. And if somebody likes one of my guitars enough to maybe donate some money, then let's do that. And uh, started spitballing the idea a little bit with my wife. And we had the idea for a raffle. We had a $10 entry point, so it was pretty inexpensive. And, you know, a lot of people participated pretty quick. Um, again, with all the social stuff going on, there's, there's quite a few raffles that were abominable pedals, did some cool stuff. And there was a lot on Instagram where the whole music community was just trying to donate and chip in where they could, I feel like. Um, but like, uh, guitar knobs, cultured guitarists, some of the other 60 cycle hum. Um, I believe you helped me share some of that stuff too. It's kind of when we first started hanging out and meeting up and, uh, just all the support that came from that out of nowhere. I just, I had hundreds of entries in it all of a sudden and uh, it was pretty popular and part of the agreement was that if it hit a certain dollar amount I would raffle off a second guitar that I already had built and ready to go so that's kind of where the second raffle just took off right after that that's amazing so how much total uh were you able to give away between the first two raffles we came in just under five thousand dollars that got donated and it was split up over 
three or four different organizations. But yeah, about five grand altogether with the two raffles that got put out for for charitable donations out of the, the two guitars. Man, so. that is great. Yeah, I remember seeing that and thinking, man, this guy seems pretty cool. So that's what got the idea uh, percolating in my head. And I spent, um, background with me is I spent all of my graduation money uh, in high school and I had my friends, uh, I didn't do any of it. I bought all the parts or they helped me buy all the parts and I built this parts shred caster basically so we'll get back into parts <laughs> caster but it was lime green with also uv paint so it like glowed super in glowing light. Awesome. Uh, it was an rg550 ibanez body with a um with a jeff hanneman esp neck floyd You're rose ripping. oh man that was back in the day when i was still practicing like sweet picking and stuff like that so uh, listening to days. too much ingve and stuff like that so um, I built that. It was awesome. But then I got to a point in my life where I like, I'm like, well, what do I do with this guitar? Like, <laughs> I can't you take it to it. church. That's for sure. It looks ridiculous. Uh, I did play it like once or twice just to try it out. And it was like, this just doesn't fit in. So, um, you know, my musical tastes have been changing, but I've had this like trusty Stratocaster for a long time. And I had the idea of getting into this parts caster build. So before we even dive into that, tell, tell for some of the people who might have no idea, we've just been throwing around a lot of like jargon and lingo. What do you mean by parts caster? And what does that mean for, you know, maybe someone who has an electric guitar and doesn't know why they would want to do something like that? Okay. Uh, well, parts caster, like in general, typically is kind of referring to having a bucket full of fender parts. And again, they're all kind of modular style and uh, piecing a guitar together from from what you have. So maybe you have a, a, a strap body and then you've got a, a, a Telecaster neck or something like that. You got to do a little bit of work on the heel or you've got a certain set of pickups that you want to pair together. Um, and then you kind of mash it together to this Frankenstein fender-esque parts caster style guitar um that's kind of where it comes from is is just frankensteining together a guitar out of out of fender stuff so beyond that um you can you know modify your existing guitar just here or there and some folks might then classify it as a parts caster because it's no longer all original just as you got it from the factory uh, all the way up to you've picked every single little piece and ordered it individually and made something out of nothing kind of all all classifies under the same category to me. And as far as, you know, as you've been able to launch things, what specifically can people come to you looking to do or wanting to make? Sure. So what I focus on primarily, I fabricate the guitar bodies myself. Um, I'm not making necks. I'm not winding pickups necessarily. Uh, but that's part of the concierge service behind my business model is anything that you're going to approach me with, um, I'll find a solution for it. Whether I can't do it personally, I've got a network of other builders, finishers. I, I know a few different pickup makers. Um, I've obviously got Bob, the guitar tech, who's just a straight up wizard with I mean, his name's his guitar world. Bob. Yeah, like, exactly. You can do whatever. <laughs> exactly. So I've got, you know, beyond my skill set, I've got a whole team of people that, that I can manage to get things done. Now, along with that, you know, there's price tags associated with custom work. And if, if you want a certain thing done a certain way, then it usually costs a certain price. So you have to kind of factor that into what you're asking for. Um, if you're expecting to buy like, you know, an entry level guitar, this, you can build a parts caster on a lower budget and you don't have to necessarily spend thousands of dollars, but you might come away something equivalent to, you know, a really nice Squire or something like that for about the same money or a little bit more, but you, it's got a little bit more soul to it. I feel like when you've picked everything out, you've done the work yourself, um, Maybe you've got some of those guitars and you want to step it up to some some nicer quality components. You want to really go for, you know, a baller neck with like all rosewood or something crazy there. Um, there's there's money associated with it. But if you've got the budget and you want to make something really wild, you can do some pretty unique, uh, you know, customization with about whatever you want with the guitar build. So 
what I'm focusing on primarily is the parts caster style stuff, meaning it's it's going to be a body um, shaped pretty much however you would like. I, I, a lot of the stuff is fender style designs because that's where the parts caster world is born out of. Um, but what I would like to do is integrate more shapes, you know, bring in other styles that maybe traditionally have set necks or neck through designs and you wouldn't see a bolt on uh, equivalent out there. But we can now make that happen. So you're not stuck to just building Stratocasters and Telecaster copies anymore. If you want to make a Mazrite style guitar, a Rickenbacker style guitar, then uh, I've got some some design options. We can make some templates and custom design whatever you want. We'll put a bolt on neck on it, some pickups, uh, bridge hardware. I can help you plan out your electronics if you want something simple. Maybe you want a five way switch and uh, throw in some, you know, parallel out of phase type stuff or something creative, give yourself some more options. That's where all the customization comes into play. Yeah. Um, I was even thinking like with the accessibility of like pairing, working with building a, a body with you, the fact that like Warmoth can make, you know, whatever looking neck with whatever heel you want. And like you said, you might have to pay for that price tag of doing something like sure. that, but that's where you're getting a guitar you know, that might look a certain way. And I think basically that gets to the point of the modular aspect. It's for the person who, you know, maybe likes this aspect of this guitar, A, and then likes this aspect, maybe the pickup sound of this guitar. And it's almost like adult guitar Legos, like putting <laughs> them together. And exactly. Yeah, getting what you want and painting it how you want and doing whatever. Yeah, guitar yeah. Lego is a, a basically a really good analogy for all this. You know, you, like I say, a body, a neck, a bridge, a pickup configuration, and that's that's your basic mold and what color you want, finish, stuff like that. Piece it together, and and you've got a guitar when you're all done. Because even even the body that you made for me, um, accessibility wise, if you were to buy a neck, like even my whole price tag, I got everything that I wanted to do so i didn't skimp on anything but i was also budget conscious as well i think putting together the pickups the wiring harness the body and the neck i was totaling it all together obviously between you know you doing your labor uh the pickups being their labor the wiring harness came uh together as a control plate so all of that was ready for me to do all the labor of assembly and it was around I, I tried to total it out a little bit i have to like actually go through receipts and look but considering the body i think you said what was that around a 300 ish to do yeah. the routing and stuff yeah you've got some chambering and a laminate top and it's it's a little bit more than just a standard body you know you got some upgrades going on but three 350 for something like that probably so all things considered it's it's coming in around a thousand dollars for a custom guitar for sure uh which is Absolutely. like uh, and, and then the, the difference to me, it's, a, it's exactly what I want. So, right. 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 And you could spec out a build like that on the custom fender shop. And again, no knock on, on fender whatsoever. I feel like they're an awesome company and they do some great stuff. And, uh, uh Brad from fender corporate was actually one of my first, probably hundred followers when I first got started. Whoa. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. Maybe <laughs> a little nervous at yeah, first. Yeah, like, yeah, I didn't yeah, know yeah. if I'm supposed to expect like a cease and desist or whatever. But, <laughs> but the dude has been nothing but. It's not Gibson, so you're a little bit safer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll tread in those waters here in the next few months and see what happens. But um, no, Fender in we'll general. Play the game. Been... How long till Gary gets sued? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. We'll Just kidding. Not. Just kidding. But uh, and Fender in general, like if you were to price out your build on their custom shop would be thousands of dollars, two or three times mm -hmm. the price. And yes, it's designed by master builders and it's not something you did by yourself. But I think there's something to learning and doing it yourself. And even if it is a little bit flubbed here, that like it's just character that you can appreciate that, you know, you did that yourself. There's going to be yeah. more heart and more soul into the appreciation of, of your instrument. And then I think that also comes through in your playing. There's just a little more comfortability when you have it in your hands. There's just something that you know in the back of your head, like, hey, I made this. And it it comes out. It's hard to really quantify or qualify exactly mm -hmm. how, but I think it does. There's a different connection. Exactly. I think I was, I was sitting there looking at it last night after I plugged it in to make sure everything worked. And I was just like, I had the same thought. I was like, you know, you know there's a nick there. 
I could have done that better. You know, it's easy to, it's easy to start looking at that and think, you know, some, for some people, you might not want to fool with that. And that is okay too. I think that's the main thing I learned is like, it's what you want to do. There's no, oh, I did it all or, oh, I did this or that. It's like, if painting your body or finishing the body is something that's kind of daunting or you don't want to do, I offer finishing as well. Like I can just about complete a kit for you that would be all finished and you would just do the assembly if you don't want to get into, maybe you're in an apartment and you can't spray lacquer or something like you want to, you know, we'll, we'll find a way around it. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that that's great. I think, um, aside from going that route, is that something that are you open to people doing something like, Hey, I want to do this. Uh, Is there any uh, model within your work to even just help someone to find and source parts and like do their own, like, you know, take a squire body and and this and that and make their own thing? Sure. So, I mean, part of what I'm offering, everything is, I come from a DIY background essentially. So, my whole purpose is to kind of cater to the DIY community ideally. Um, I do full complete builds. If you want me to make a guitar and and ship something completely finished and ready to play and plug in, I'll gladly do it. But uh, I I want to help people make their own stuff. It's all about that connection to your instrument and and your your musical tools, essentially. So, yeah, if you have an existing guitar and you just want to make some changes, um, anybody that wants to put any kind of inquiry or hit me up on Instagram, I'll gladly answer some basic questions about what you want to do. I can provide a, a general quote. If it's just questions and sourcing parts, then maybe a 50 or $100 kind of concierge service fee, and you'll have me on retainer for a couple weeks until you're ready to order everything you need. Um, if the the concierge kind of thing is built into a body order if you order anything from me i'm it's just part of my service is i'm going to help you make sure that you know exactly what you need that's what sets me apart from ordering maybe a a similar custom body that you could get from ebay or another source maybe even a little bit cheaper honestly um but i'm going to be able to stay in communication with you while you're working. I'm going to make sure you're comfortable with what I'm doing, kind of give you approval over like wood selection and placement of things, just kind of keep you in tune with the build mm-hmm. as it's going to make sure it's, it's exactly what you want at the end of the day. And I can literally vouch for every step of that. And I almost feel like you're like totally underselling that <laughs> uh, from the aspect of from my end, you know, I, I, I was all in at the beginning. I was like, man, this guy's great to work with. But then I also started hitting some bumps where I was like, "Mm, this neck isn't fitting the way I thought it should. And then that was kind of the first bump. And then uh, the next bump was getting onto uh, doing the dyeing. So I I did the uh, leather dyes instead of paint. So I did the leather dyes. And uh, just even for me, the most helpful part was like, Hey, I'm just going to say this and I'm going to make sure that what I'm saying sounds right. Can you just check what I'm about to say? (laughs) And for me, that was usually enough confidence I needed. Uh, It was less usually like help, except for in the middle of the finish, it was help. But uh, it was more like, hey, can I spit this off of you? Because there's a lot of stuff on the internet. Right. And, and And what's crazy on the internet is like, what each of these people are saying is probably right, but they can't tell you everything about how they do everything. So exactly. I'm going, okay, that might be right. That also seems super hard. This seems like a good idea, but I don't know if it's a good idea or not. So it was just really nice to go, Hey Gary, uh, how does this look? Or I'm going to do these next three steps. Or even after you've told me the steps, I said, okay, I'm going to repeat it back to you. (laughs) So it was just great to be able to check in and also feel like I had someone in my corner, like, uh, you know, Hey, check it out. Like, how's it going? Cause I think, you know, you said it too, like, Hey, I'm just as excited as you are to see how this is coming together. So for sure, man. Yeah. Watching your build come together is it's been super rewarding. I, I did a little bit of the work involved in that to get you started, but the rest you of did quite a bit you, of the work. <laughs> you're underselling that as well, but, uh, no, it, it's been awesome. I don't think I would have knowing my personality. I think if I would have started this on my own and not had, if I was only trying to look at forums or only trying to look at YouTube, 
I think I probably would have given up. I think I probably would have been discouraged. So, well, uh, you kind of hit the nail there. When there's there's information all over the place, and when it comes to musical instruments, there's a science behind, you know, wood selection and which way the grain is facing when it's glued together, and the the tonal differences between a bolt on neck and a neck through design. There's there's some science behind that to tell you one way or the other. But at the end of the day, it's it's very subjective to the end user. Because it's not just the wood in your guitar. It's, you know, if you have a floor full of pedals, the tone wood in your guitar is pretty much a joke. It's all going to sound about the same because you're running <laughs> yeah. it through so many stages of drive and amplifiers and modulation and everything else. So uh, everything is subjective and customized based off what you're wanting to do. And it, it, it's hard to tell online where somebody might have done their steps and it worked out fine for them, but you're doing it and your finish is sticky, but you can't necessarily directly contact them and be like, Hey, what am I doing wrong? And then you go and watch a YouTube video of somebody doing a similar process with a slightly different technique. And it may or may not help you get where you want to go. So and the anxiety just starts to go. Yeah. Up. <laughs> <laughs> Money you've got invested time. You've got invested just the sheer like expectation of this guitar that you're working on that you're excited about, you know, and then things start going south and it can be morally crushing when you've got all that wrapped up into it emotionally and physically and financially. So yeah, it, it can be a little bit daunting. And I think it's, it's what I ran into myself a few times with various aspects of a build where I, you know, had somebody else try and help me with something, drill holes through the body. And it's just a little bit crooked. Would it have played? Would it have worked? Would it have had the right tension on the bridge? And it would have been okay. Yes, but it's not to my standard. It doesn't look perfect mm. and like a professionally made instrument. It looked like something that somebody made in a garage somewhere. And that's not what I was happy with. So I've, I've, I've been through all those ups and downs. I've, I've wired things the wrong way and plugged them in and had to figure out why they don't work. <laughs> and I've tried a couple different finish techniques that aren't successful. Honestly, um, I'm still practicing on how to do binding. I can do it, but it's not the cleanest thing in the world. So I'm not offering it until I'm a hundred percent satisfied that it's going to look killer every single time I put it out. So I'm still learning and growing and, and, and picking up techniques myself. So I can just imagine from somebody that's starting off from a zero point, that's, that's kind of the client that I'm looking to help out the most, the ones who really need it. Yeah. I think there, you mentioned it a little bit earlier. There's something to be said about the, and it is the thing that I envy about all the DIY stuff. And it was kind of my goal of 2020 of like, you know what? You're faced with this weird time, but now you've got this ability to do some of these things. Like I was even talking to you about earlier, like uh, do some of these things you've been wanting to do. Like I had my friends build me that part ca parts caster in, in high school. And, you know, I watch all of this stuff about DIY guitar and DIY pedals and all of this stuff. And I'm like, I had too much head knowledge or just head, not even knowledge, head acquaintanceship. Like I had known that all this stuff is, had existed, but it was like, okay, now you have to actually do it. Right. And for me, the actually doing it with, ended up being super rewarding in a way that even if there weren't, you know, if I would were to spend the same amount of money and buy the guitar that was hanging on my wall right now, I would feel less for it right. than the intense like uh, connection and just like uh, not ownership in the sense of like, this is mine, don't take it. But the ownership of like the craftsmanship of it. And even like you said, the, for me, yep. the um, unraveling of how much more appreciation I have for craftsmanship in general of like, wow, like what he did to get this body like this way is like, I underappreciated these kind of things before, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, it's once you start cool. to get into it, then you realize you learn that you how much you don't know, you know, like I still feel like the stuff that I'm doing, I do not consider myself a luthier by any means, because I personally, I think that's disrespectful to some of the guys that are doing some, some amazing luthery out there. And I more or less feel like a woodworker where I, I've got some computer background where I, I can design a template. And I've I just recently acquired a, a laser cutting machine so I can make my own templates. Um, Very cool. But I'm, I'm not using a computer anywhere past that. It's it's all done with MDF templates and a table router and everything's kind of cut and handled by hand. I'm just trying to keep it, uh, I don't know, 
everybody has asked me like, what are you going to do if you need to scale up? And I'm not too worried about that at this point. Honestly, I'm able to handle my workload with my build process. And I feel like there's more soul that goes into it when you're doing it by hand and taking more time. Um, I heard recently, like Paul Reed Smith was able to crank out one of their high end guitars in something like six hours. Whoa. And from a business standpoint, you know, Mr. Capitalist in nature, like, that side of me is like, holy cow, that's amazing. Like you guys can just crank out these guitars, but then th the soul side of it, that's not really tangible. It's how much is really going into that? How much effort and attention to detail? Like, yes, you can do the same thing, right? A thousand times in a row in a day, but what does it really mean at the end of the day? If, if it's all just for making money, you know, you're not, sure. not doing it to, to make cool guitars and make cool musicians out there. You're, you're doing it to make a big corporation more wealthy and, and you I, know it, it like it is what it is you know and it's like and there's if, no no skin off of that his back either but it's like but it's just different and you it, know as someone big, looking to do a parts caster is looking for something different precisely and not, not to knock a big company i i mean i own a gibson guitar and i own a taylor guitar personally i'm a little more proud of one company than i am the other um <laughs> But, you know, they're they're just operating on a different scale as opposed to like J, my JML guitar that I have. And mm -hmm. I, I own serial number 84 of his as opposed Sweet. to they make thousands and thousands of guitars like on a weekly basis with some of those companies. So just something different about a small batch, the, the attention that you get from one person that's really in tune with what they're doing. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's hard to put a name or a quantifiable, tangible kind of quality on it but it's it's definitely there but i and the other thing is like as i even just as a like music industry adjacent podcaster i'm already starting to realize some of those things that people say about the music industry uh music uh instruments industry of like it's all interconnected and now i'm you know starting to build some of these relationships with these people and just realizing that like as much as the instruments are cool meeting all of these cool people is really the the best part. So you don't yeah. get that when you're turning something out and you're keeping an assembly line doing yada, 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 yada. It, it's, it's different, but they're doing their thing over there. For sure. Yeah. The whole community of like independent small builders. I mean, even all the way up, I, I've got a really cool working relationship with Walrus and they're nationally distributed, but they still have this boutique mentality of how they operate and they're very employee driven and focused and, they don't feel like a big corporation to me. But I mean, outside of that, um, John from Rare Buzz, Aisha from Low, uh, there's, there's been a, hand of, a handful of folks that are just extremely warm and, and supportive and kind of just welcomed me right in and helped share my work and get other people's eyes on me. And it's just awesome. I, I, I can't help but to try and propagate that with you know my clients and other folks that I see trying to break into it in whatever way that they're wanting to. Very cool. And a good, uh, good group of company to keep as well. Well, that Absolutely. brings me on to where I want to kind of follow up next is you also offer other things um, as well, including cabinets and, and pedal enclosures. So what are what are some of the other things for those people going off the beaten parts caster path? For sure. That yeah, you're able to do too. That's coming more from like the woodworking aspect, you know, I mean, I've, I've been cutting bodies for a while and got to the point where I've just got some boxes and bins of all these scrap pieces of really cool, oddly shaped pieces of wood. Mm. And uh, I've, I've seen some other wooden enclosures. Um, Lollygagger effects does some really cool stuff too. Uh, uh, Sean, I believe from that company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, his wife, Colette, they, they've both been very friendly and helpful and supportive of what I'm doing too. Um, but they kind of, opened my eyes up to a wooden pedal enclosure and then Shones Wood and some of the other companies too that are also doing it just seems very cool. And then in talking with Jay from JML, he's like, oh yeah, check this out. And he pulls out this like live edge wooden enclosure that he's working on for Electro Foods. And uh, it's kind of joined together like a neck through. It's got these cool mahogany like stringers and pinners and stuff on it. Whoa. It's just really cool woodwork. And then it's got a live edge on the one side. So it's just going to look killer on somebody's pedal board somewhere. Um, so yeah, uh, wooden pedal enclosures have just been something that kind of piqued my interest and, uh, they're really fairly easy to make for me out of the scraps that would otherwise just be wasted or, you know, turned into something else small. So, uh, it's a way for 
turning it into a project that other DIY builders can can benefit from. Um, if you're building your own pedals, or maybe if you want to kind of just figure out how things work and you want to rehouse a pedal, I'm doing essentially like a 125B and a 1590B sized case. Those are two pretty popular ones to work with. Mm-hmm. I can do custom sizes for whatever, um, but those are just the two two popular ones right now. And uh, if you were to buy like a circuit board and a, a packet of kits from Mammoth or, I mean, there's a plethora of places that have mm-hmm. DIY pedals. And rather than using their metal enclosure, you can uh, put it in one of my wooden ones and it'll look 10 times cooler. Very cool. Very cool. Well, did we miss any other things that you wanted to talk about today? Is there any other uh, categories? Um, outside of the pedals, I'm also doing uh, uh, speaker enclosures, just speaker cabinets pretty much, and then also uh, pedal boards. Um, Ooh, very cool. Yeah, yeah, that's all. You can People can look at that not only on your website, but y- you have a pretty active reverb shop too, right? Well, I'm trying to pull away from reverb. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to direct everything. I found most of my business is coming from direct sales right on Instagram. I do try to stay pretty active on there. Uh, Facebook, not so much. I've not had as much luck with, but I am definitely on Instagram. So if you have some questions, you can email me through my website. I do have some forms for specific requests for guitars or builds or pedal enclosures. If it's something that you don't see on there, or you just want to hit me up directly, uh, follow me on Instagram, send me a message and I'll, I'll hit you back as soon as I can. Very cool, Gary. Well, what, um, What piece of advice would you start just to, for the first person, um, who, you know, has heard this conversation and thinks, I just want to learn more. Where would you send them to learn more about just parts casters in general, any good, even down to any good YouTube videos or channels or other people to check out, uh, what would be some good resources for the person who's like interested, don't know where to go next. You know, you kind of caught me off guard with that one. I don't have one necessary YouTube channel that I go to. That's the Um, problem. No, that's what, no, that's good. There is a whole, why don't you tell me and we'll put, we'll put some, uh, we'll make a playlist or something. Well, that's kind of the idea behind the podcast projects that I'm doing is I want to see more of that out there. So hopefully the videos and, you know, stuff that we're working on together is going to be that resource that people are looking for to kind of help get their feet wet and feel like they've got some stable, consistent information to go off of and kind of get the ground running from there. I like that. So what are, what are some of the other crews that you're working with so they can go check out the, the stuff that they're doing as well? You, you mentioned culture guitarists. I know get offset. Yeah, um, Emily Emily mm-hmm. from Get Offset is doing an RD build. Um, she's got a lot of stuff going on. Their podcast is pretty active, too, so it's it's kind of creeping along, but uh, she is making a little bit of progress. Um, and then Culture Guitarist, has uh, they're going to be doing two guitars with me, and we've got uh, Vigilant Guitars. Um, Trevor from uh, a company up there, he does some really amazing stuff uh, based out of BC in Canada, I believe he really focuses on like the avant-garde style, uh, just Mm. multi-scale, uh, just wild stuff, man. Weird shapes. If you want LEDs in your guitar, like he'll do it. Um, (laughs) yeah, he's, he's, he's the next level. Guitars into spaceships. Yeah. yeah, Right. Right. He's, he's doing the artistic kind of just out there stuff that I hope to attain to one day, but he's already there. Um, so it's kind of, I feel very honored to be, be paired with this guy. Uh, through Cultured Guitarist. I'm really fortunate to uh, just have all these connections just kind of open up. Like I said, the whole community has been super warm and inviting of everything that I'm doing. Um, outside of that, uh, who else? Was Porter Pickups worked on us, uh, worked on the pickups for our project. Gun Street Wiring is a really cool company to work for if you're intimidated by soldering or how to configure things. Maybe you want more than just a three-way mm-hmm. selector switch and you want to know what's out there. Um, they're, they're Sean, Sean was just like you very easy. I literally texted him. I was like, Hey, I'm sorry. It's the weekend. <laughs> yeah. And then he, I said, I did like a really crude, like I took a picture and did the, uh, edit in the, uh, just the photos gallery. I, I like did the like circling things with like marking it up all with my finger. And I was like this, 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 right. And then he sent me, me back another one that was like this, this, this. Yeah. Right. So it was the same thing. Like he, uh, him and Brian over at Porter was very good about like, 
I was really easily able to collaborate and go, Hey, I have this, uh, this person here with this wiring kit. They said, I need to do this. And Brian's like, cool, we can wire that to do that. And same thing is like really easy. And then I had those shipped straight to you. So you were able to make a, a route that was perfect for, for that. So it was just so easy to get the whole process going. Yeah, there's there can be a lot of ins and outs to everything. And uh, whenever you start a build process with me, like I say, the concierge service is just part of the whole project. So we're going to talk about what all is going into it and what all that entails. And if you're just using some regular PA, PAF sized casing, they're they're very easy to route for. But if you've got something wild that you want to use or something unique or maybe a, a, an old vintage pickup that came out of a different style guitar, we can get some arrangements. I can send you some shipping labels and you can send those parts to me and I can custom fit anything that we need into your build. Super cool, Gary. Well, I think, I hope that people are super excited now. I hope they go check out, we'll link to as many um, resources as we can here in the show notes. And even as we compile them, we'll put more, we'll update it. Sure. Um, I want to know a couple of last things is what, would you hope that this encourages people to make more music? Like why is it important that we build part casters, we make more music and things like that? Well, I think building your own instrument is if you're really truly dedicated to playing an instrument, regardless of what it is, I think it's important to understand how it's made, kind of where it came from, how it evolved. You get the history behind it to really get a full appreciation and beyond just, being a, an instrumental player, the next step is is building one. And that's where parts caster is going to step in. So there's multiple levels to building an instrument. Like I say there's some very high levels of luthery where some guys will literally go out into the woods and they chop down the tree and they will forge every piece of metal on the guitar. Wow. Pretty, pretty heavy duty dudes. You know, I am not there yet personally. Most folks aren't going to do that. That is so, a goal though. That's right, right. Like the viking of the human. <laughs> levels, like levels to everything, man. So the, the parts caster world is the entry level to building your own instrument, picking out what you want in every single aspect. If aesthetics are your thing, we'll get the color and the pick guard you're looking for. If you want a certain weight because it's you know not comfortable to stand with a 12 pound guitar or something like that, we'll make a, a chambered body and get it to be lightweight. You know, we can customize whatever you want to make it better for you. So if your instrument's more comfortable, if you're more connected to it, you know, all this stuff plays into things that are going on in the back of your mind almost kind of subconsciously when this instrument is when your your conscious mind is is concentrating on the music that you're doing all this other stuff still plays a factor so i think it's all important build your own instrument you got that connection you're going to be making cooler stuff i saw somebody that that's what we'll end with i saw somebody say that oh i think it was on reddit i was looking at diy guitar on reddit and somebody said i think everyone should have to build a parts caster so that they are like a Jedi that's built their own lightsaber. And I think that that is a good analogy. I was like, yes, that is how it feels. It feels like, wow, I'm really connected to this thing. That's, that's the tool of your, you know, trade if you're making music or however you want to put it, but that's, that's literally your instrument. That's, that's your tool of destruction or creation or however you want to look at it. But if you make it, whatever you're making with it is going to be 10 times better. Hmm. Well, I think we've gone ad nauseum for some people. So for the people that want to see how the sausage is made, you can go look at all the links in the show notes. If you just want to go see a pretty guitar that I was able to make and think about how could I even just buy one of those, you can check out our Instagram. I've been posting about it a lot. And you'll be hearing about the whole guitar, the partnerships for the rest of season three. So uh, if you don't have anything else, I think I'm ready to wrap this thing up. What do you think, Gary? I think we're good, man. This is awesome. All right. Well, for Gary and the Parts Caster Concierge and for Chris, everybody remember, give more grace, share more love, and make more music. Thanks, everybody. All right. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And as always, if you enjoyed and want to learn more about the guests, their info is in the show notes as well as how you can support the show. And the best way is to leave a rating and review and tell a friend. Anything else, if you want to make a donation, buy some merch, uh, follow us on Instagram, get in touch with me. You can all do that through the links in the show notes. But 
Until next time, give more grace, share more love, and make more music. 